gardener and a passionate entomologist. And she told us that she is really an educator. She um, created a nature-based preschool for the park district, which she runs twice, twice a week. Uh, and she has, does outreach to the public schools for preschool through fourth grade. And she also does general public outreach, um, just about all kinds of uh, nature subjects. And so I'm really looking forward to hearing what she has to say about moths. So here we go. Thank you so much, Adrian. Uh, let me share my screen. We good? We're good, Chelsea. We, yep, awesome. it's in presentation view. Okay. Um, so thank you guys so much for inviting me. Um, I didn't realize I was part of this overall dark sky um, seminar, but that is awesome. I'm so glad you guys are advocating for that. Um, I'll talk about that later. Um, I do, I wish I lived in Cook County because I have 10 calorie, calorie pear trees at my new house that I have to chop down. Um, I wish I could trade them in for some new natives, but I will get some anyway, even though I don't live out there. Um, so gardening for moths, you guys might be thinking, why garden for moths? That seems kind of crazy. Um, people don't really think about moths because they're usually nocturnal. Um, and moths don't get a lot of love historically. Um, if you look on Amazon, you do a search on Amazon, you'll see lots of gardening for butterfly books. Butterflies have always been very popular. And for a good reason, we got, we got some birds and bees people are starting to care about now. Um, but butterflies are beautiful, um, and I'm sure we can all agree with that. And, but the title for the world's most beautiful insect, can anyone guess who that belongs to? You can just enter it in the chat box. The world's most beautiful insect. For some reason, we're not being able to, able to see the chat box. I just see them starting to come in. Can you see okay. them, Chelsea? I can't. Oh. Well, would you like me to read them? I see sure. lots of votes for Luna Moth, Madagascan it... Moth. Oh, someone got it. So it is. <laughs> Scarabs. So smart. So the Madagascar, Madagascan sunset moth is the world's most beautiful insect. And it is very butterfly-ish, but it is a moth. Um, and we'll talk about how you can tell the difference between the two. So here are some of the most beautiful moths from around the world. Um, so these aren't found in the US um, or in our region, but around the world, these are all really pretty moths. I think we can all agree with that. Um, and even in our region, we have some really beautiful moths. Someone mentioned this Luna moth that's in the bottom center. Um, a lot of people think that's our most beautiful moth in, in the Midwest. Um, but not all moths are quite so lovely when you look at them. Um, this is the tufted bird dropping moth, and it is a bird dropping mimic. So if you look at it from afar, it does look like bird poop. Um, and that's just for protection. So a bird is not going to want to eat something that it excreted. So that's how it survives. But if you do look up close, um, you can see even our kind of boring moths, we call them, uh, have a lot more texture and color and detail if you look at them up close. So even our teeny tiny moths are sometimes really cool if you just give them a chance. So any guesses, how many butterfly species have been recorded in Ohio? And this would be, this would apply to Illinois too. It would be about the same. I'm seeing a 70. 70, it's a good guess. And no one, they're all coming as direct messages to me. I'm sorry about that. So I don't know. Uh, oh, I see a hundred and two thousand eight hundred and fifty. 
Oh, that's very specific. <laughs> <laughs> so 100 is pretty close. In Ohio, we have about 140 butterfly species. Um, or 160, my bad. What about moths? Can you guess as how many species of moths have been recorded? This would be the same for Illinois. I think more or less, or any specific guesses? We get Robin, age eight, guesses 100. Oh, so Someone she thinks else a guesses little less. 200. 200. It is, it is higher. It is much, much higher. So over 3,000. Oh, we so have we a do have people. Oh, wow. Were there still guesses coming in? Yeah, there were five times more. Yeah, so it's, it's a lot. So chances are if you're finding a caterpillar, um, it's going to turn into a moth, not into a butterfly. So we have way, way, way more moth species than we do butterflies. Um, and this, usually in my presentations, I say, I don't expect you to be able to see everything. But since you're at your computer, you can. Um, but I don't expect you to read all of these words. This is just a phylogenetic tree of the insect order Lepidoptera, which both butterflies and moths are in. Um, and then if you see that pink rectangle that's kind of at the upper center, um, that is the butterflies. So you can see genetically the butterflies are within the rest of the moths. Um, so we thought that uh, entomologist Akito Kawahara summed it up best when he said the bottom line is all butterflies are moths and there's no such thing as butterflies. All right, so if you don't believe me, we're gonna take a little quiz. So I want you guys to tell me if you think this picture is of a butterfly or a moth. We're getting lots of votes for moth. Moth, 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 moth. Moth. So, so everyone oh. says moth. Yeah. As you know, I'm trying to trick you, right? <laughs> So yeah, this is a moth. You guys got this one. Um, it is one of our day flying moths. So not all moths are nocturnal. This is called the eight-spotted forester. Um, it flits around really fast. You'll see them just nectaring on flowers during the day. Um, a lot of our day flying moths are black and white like this one. Um, I like his little orange leg warmers. It makes him pretty cute. But if you look at the end of his antenna, that's um, kind of curved to the side, you can see, um, can you see my cursor? Mm -hmm. So there's like nothing, it just comes straight out. There's nothing really on the end. And we'll look, we'll compare that to some of the butterflies we're gonna see. Um, but that's one of the key differences, or if you if you want to know if you're seeing a moth or a butterfly, even though all butterflies are moths, that's how you can tell. All right, what about this guy? Butterfly or moth? Butterfly, moth, flicker, moth. Moth, moth, butterfly. Oh, so it sounds about split. It is a butterfly. So this someone is a says, of butter. Someone said skipper. Yes, skipper is right. Skipper. So this is one of our skippers. Um, they're kind of just a, a family of butterflies that they do look very mothish. They hold their wings a little bit differently than butterflies typically do. They're furrier than most butterflies, um, but they are most. Yeah, most butterflies, but they are still butterflies. They're not moths. All right, what about this one? Moth. 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 Butterfly, butterfly, moth for sure. Someone said. Moth, butterfly. Oh, people. Butterfly. What do you think, Laura? I think it's a moth, but I'm scared. <laughs> it is a moth, you're right. So if you were listening to what I just said about the antennae, you can see the antennae don't really have anything on the end. Um, this is called either it's either the crocus geometer or the false crocus geometer. They're really hard to tell apart, but they can look very butterfly-ish, especially when they hold their wings together like that. All right, what about this one? This is probably the trickiest one. Butterfly, 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 moth. Yeah, 
Anybody else want to guess? Moth, moth, fat body, Linda says. Oh, the skippers have fat bodies though too. Butterfly. This is about split. It is a moth. This is a bluish spring moth and they look a lot like these guys, which mm -hmm. you've probably seen before. This is a spring azure butterfly. So if you look at um, the end of this antenna right here, do you see how it's kind of uh, more bulbous or like fatter at the end? That's how you can tell it's a butterfly. But they do look very much alike. They're both about the same size. All right, what about this one? Butterfly. I can't trick you guys anymore. Someone's saying skipper. Yeah. So this is another skipper. one of our skippers. Butterfly, butterfly, moth, moth. Apex butterfly. skipper, yeah. Yep. And that's on our native, one of our native viruses. Good job, guys. All right, what about this one? Lots of moths. It is a moth, yeah. Did anybody say wasp? This no, is one of our someone said clear wing moth. Oh, you guys, you guys are good. You know your moths. So this is one of our clear wing moths. Um, that's a wasp mimic. They're pretty little, but they you can see them nectaring at flowers during the day too. I think they're pretty cool. All right, so why moths? Um, Moths are more than just eye candy. And hopefully I've convinced you that they are pretty, but they're way more important than just for looks. Um, can anyone tell me what all of these moths are doing in these pictures? Pollinating. Pollinating, yeah. So moths are pollinators. So they're drinking nectar, they aren't intentionally pollinating, but that's how pollination works, you guys know. I'm gonna talk about some of the really cool um, kind of special relationships that moths have with our some of our native orchids. So this is crane fly orchid. Um, it is really cool because the leaves come up and each plant only has one leaf and they come up like the end of November. Um, and they do their photosynthesis throughout the winter when the leaves are off of the trees. Um, because they're getting more sunlight on the forest floor. Um, and then when spring comes, they senesce, the uh, leaf withers back. Um, and then if you're lucky in about this time of year, maybe a couple weeks ago, you're usually early August, um, you'll get a flower spike that is the orchid. Um, and they're not the showiest of our orchids. A lot of people probably wouldn't even notice them if they walked by them. But they're really cool because they have this asymmetrical flower um, and you can see like this part of the flower is higher than this part. And they have this really long nectar spur. So that nectar is gonna be found right at the base of that nectar spur. So it's gonna take an insect with a really long proboscis or tongue to access that nectar. Um, and moths are the ones that do that. Um, and what happens, how they pollinate the orchids is when that moth is drinking from the nectar spur, its eye is forced against these pollen sacs that the orchids have called uh, pollinaria. Um, and the pollen, pollinaria actually sticks to the moth's eye. And then when the moth flies to a different flower, that pollinaria sticks to that flower. And then that's how the orchid gets pollinated, which is pretty cool. Um, and one of Ohio botanists, his name was Warren Stoudemire, he kind of staked out these orchids at night and discovered some of the species that were pollinating them. And this is one of them. So this is called the common looper. Um, it's one of the little brown moths that you wouldn't notice or you probably think was ugly. But when, when you look at it close, it's really quite beautiful. Um, this is the brown hooded outlet. And then this one was really surprising to me because we usually consider these to be pests. This is the armyworm moth. Um, they're super common. Um, I'm not sure about out in the Chicago area, but uh, in Ohio, it was probably three falls ago, we had a really bad outbreak of these and they were just folating people's lawns and people were trying to spray for them and get rid of them. Um, but even something that we normally consider as a pest can be super important for um, some of our native plants, like the green play orchid. 
So this is a threatened orchid in the United States, um, the Eastern Prairie Fringed Orchid. We have a few spots in Ohio where it can be found. Um, and my co-author, Jim McCormick, staked this out one night and discovered that the Carolina Sphinx moth is one of its pollinators. Um, and if you, any of you are vegetable gardeners, you might be familiar with this moth. Um, and just looking at it, it's a very beautiful moth. It's very big. It's a fast flyer, kind of flies like a hummingbird. Um, but this is its caterpillar, the tobacco hornworm. A lot of people call them tomato worms. Um, but the technical name is a tobacco hornworm. And yes, they do eat our tomatoes and our peppers. Um, but once again, even organisms we consider as pests can sometimes be providing valuable pollination services to some of our um, struggling natives. And then the last orchid I want to talk about is called the tubercle rain orchid. Um, it's listed as vulnerable in, Ohio, in Ohio. I'm not sure about in Illinois, um, but it's very uh, something you probably wouldn't notice either if you're walking through the woods. Um, it likes wet areas. Um, but my co-author Jim and I were checking this out one day and he, he's a botanist by trade and I love plants, I love native plants, um, but insects ex have always excited me more. So we get to this spot and I see all these tiny little insects flying around all of these flowers. I'm like, what, what is going on here? What is this? So, and these guys were so tiny. I know that it looks big in the picture, but they were mosquito sized. Um, so I started taking pictures with a macro lens and realized that they were these little moths. Um, and then this picture on the right um, is really cool because you can actually see the pollination happening. So you can see the moths proboscis. And then this is that pollinaria I was talking about. So all the little pollen grains are kind of bundled up into this package. Um, and then hopefully the moth would fly to a different flower and a different plant and the pollination would happen. But, and I didn't even realize this was happening when I was taking the pictures. When I went back through my pictures, I saw that and thought it was pretty cool. All right, so let's talk about moth nectar plants in general, if we want to garden for moths. So you wanna be thinking about our natives that are pale or white um, in color. Um, the, sometimes the scent becomes stronger in the evening. Um, and then think about the flower shape too, just like you would for bees or other insects. Um, moths would like nectar that is a little bit harder to get to, not right at the surface. Um, and if I'm sure you all have common milkweed planted, if you've never, checked out your common milkweed at night, you should. Um, it's usually covered in moths. Just take a flashlight out and shine it on, on the flowers and you should see some, some cool stuff. Um, so here's a, just a kind of a list of some of the really good nectar, nectar plants for moths. Like I said, milkweed is one of the most popular one. A lot of times uh, sunflowers like, or plants in the sunflower family, um, like black-eyed Susans, I'll find a lot of moths on at night. Um, Culver's root is a really good one. So why moths? Moths are even more than just beautiful pollinators. This is the hummingbird clearwing, which I'm sure many of you have seen in your gardens. They look like little hummingbirds. So why? I've got a great tree frog on the left, eastern red bat, um, a, a southern flying squirrel, and a red-eyed vireo. What do all these things have in common? What do they have to do with moths? You guys have any guesses? Sorry, Chelsea, I was muted. Eat them. Oh. What people say so much. Yes. Well, this is their predators. Yes, you got it. So moths are food. Moths are just one of the most important food sources. And I think this quote kind of sums it up. Moths and their caterpillars are responsible for transferring more energy from plants to animals than all other herbivores combined. So if you combine deer, you combine groundhogs, think of all the other herbivores, even the insect herbivores. Moths and their caterpillars transfer more energy um, from plants to other animals than all of those. So it just kind of blows my mind every time I think about it. It's just crazy. So in North America, there are 310 bird species that depend on caterpillars for part of their diet. This is a song sparrow with a beak full of caterpillars. 
Um, on the left is a Tennessee warbler and then a rose-breasted grosbeak. And both of those species, along with that red Iberio I showed earlier, um, caterpillars are the majority of their diet. So they really heavily rely on them year round. That's not just during breeding season. This is the worm eating warbler. It's probably the worst named warbler there is. Um, a lot of times we think of, oh, like the early bird gets the worm. You know, the birds are out there eating worms. Um, but really birds are out there eating caterpillars, not worms. There's a few species that are hunting for worms, but not too many. And you might be thinking, why caterpillars? Like what's so special about them? Well, they're very soft. Um, usually they don't have, they're not covered in a lot of hairs. Some of them are. Um, they contain a lot of protein. They're very nutritious. They have a lot of carotenoids. Um, they have a lot of fat and they contain more protein than beef. So my co-author likes to compare um, caterpillars to especially some of our bigger ones to hot dogs. So of course he had to uh, put this guy in a hot dog bun and get a photo. So this is the hickory horn devil and it's our biggest caterpillar in our region. Um, and they do grow to be the size of a hot dog. This guy actually I kept to raise and he kept eating for two weeks after this picture was taken. So he got even bigger than this believe it or not. Um, and then this is the beautiful moth that they turn into. So this is our regal moth. Um, and it's probably our most massive moth um, by weight, but not our biggest moth. Very cute though. So most importantly, um, birds rely on caterpillars to feed their young during nesting season. If you've ever read any of Doug Bellamy's books or listened to his talks, you know this already. Um, but just super, super important for those reasons. They're easy to digest, soft, they're highly nutritious. Um, they really are like little sausages for chicks. This is an Eastern bluebird um, and Doug Calamy and his colleagues have done some research just to see, they set up cameras on nesting boxes to see how many caterpillars that are actually needed to raise a nest of um, chicks to fledging age, and they found that it takes over 6,000 caterpillars, which is just mind-blowing. Um, and then if you think about the number of bluebirds, just bluebirds, not all of our other birds that are nesting. Um, in Ohio, we have over 200,000 nesting pairs of just bluebirds. So I kind of did some mathing, and that equates to 1 billion, 200 million caterpillars. And that's just to get them to fledging age, even after they fledge, the parents are still responsible for feeding them. So you could probably double or triple that number um, to actually get them to where they can start feeding themselves. Um, so it's just really incredible. Now think about all of the other bird species, not just bluebirds that depend on caterpillars. And that's just so many caterpillars. <laughs> that would be lots of zeros. Um, this is an American kestrel and you can see it feeding its chick. Um, one of our sphinx caterpillars, it's nice and big. Um, but 90% of the bird species that are in decline are terrestrial birds that feed insects to their young. Um, and I feel like that directly correlates with our, our, our insect declines, which we'll talk about a little bit later too. Um, and this is kind of common sense, but I feel like it's really important to think about. Um, insufficient avail avail availability of caterpillars and other insects during nesting season leads to smaller clutch sizes or starving chicks. So if they don't have enough food to feed their babies, they're not gonna be successful. Um, this is a really cool one. So this is the golden crown kinglet. Um, if you are familiar with birds at all, this guy is really little. Um, some of them migrate, but some of them choose to overwinter. Um, and for something that small, it just requires a lot of energy to keep their body temperatures up during the winter, especially during cold temperatures. Um, so they are just constantly hunting, constantly finding food, and they are completely insectivorous. So they don't eat seeds. They're not going to come to your feeders. Um, they don't eat, drink nectar, not that there would be nectar available in the winter, um, but they have to eat insects. Um, so for a long time, it was kind of a mystery. What are these guys finding to eat in the middle of winter? I mean, there aren't a lot of insects that are out in winter, obviously. So I'll just go ahead and reveal the surprise. So uh, Bern Heinrich, he's a biologist out on the East Coast. He discovered that um, they're eating these caterpillars called one-spotted variants. 
Um, they are really good stick mimics. They're one of our inchworm caterpillars, um, but they overwinter as caterpillars. So those chick or chickadees, the golden crown kinglets are out hunting for those all day long. Um, and then you can see the moth they turn into. It's a really common moth, not very showy, but super important for the kinglets. Now, caterpillars are not only important for birds, they're also important for a lot of other organisms like wasps. You might not be a fan of wasps, but hope that can change your mind. Um, these wasps in these pictures are not the social wasps that are gonna have a nest to defend and come out and sting you if you get close to their nest. These are just solitary wasps. Um, and they're really just hard working mamas out there that are trying to fend for their babies. Um, so they will uh, sting the caterpillar, inject venom and paralyze the caterpillar. And they'll, they'll take the caterpillar back to a uh, burrow in the ground that they've created and lay an egg on it. And then when the egg hatches, they, um, the wasp larva will consume the caterpillar. The caterpillar is still alive. So it's still fresh, it just can't move. Um, so it can't escape. So it's kind of the wasp's way for preserving fresh food for its baby when it hatches. So they're just good mamas. Don't hate them. This is my favorite wasp. This is the great golden digger wasp. Um, I think they're really beautiful with the golden thorax and head and the orange abdomen and legs. Um, they actually don't hunt caterpillars. They hunt um, katydids and or other orthopterans. But we just wanted to show this picture off because it's so pretty. Um, and then we have parasitoid wasps. So parasitoid kind of sounds like parasite and they are parasites, but parasitoids are parasites that actually kill their host in the end. Um, so not a good fate for the caterpillars, but good for the parasitoid wasps. So they will actually inject their eggs into the caterpillar. And then um, the, they're, when the larvae hatch, they eat the caterpillar from the inside out. So they're usually just feeding on its hemolymph, which is kind of the liquid blood type thing inside of insects. Um, they, inv they kind of avoid all of their organs so the caterpillar can stay al alive as long as possible. Um, and here is what they look like when they are emerging. So these green, they look like kind of extra legs on the caterpillar. This is not supposed to be on the caterpillar. So these are the wasp babies that have chewed their way through the caterpillar skin. Um, and that's just what they look like. They don't really look like much of anything, maybe little green maggots. Um, and then they spin cocoons around themselves um, and they complete their pupation on the outside of the caterpillar. So if you've ever had the tobacco hornworms in your garden, you've probably seen these before. Um, a lot of people think these are the wasp eggs, but they're actually the wasp cocoons. So the eggs would have been injected inside of the caterpillar. And then once they eat their way out, they spin these cocoons. Um, and then in another few days or week, the adult wasps will emerge from these cocoons and the caterpillar will eventually die. A very gruesome fate for the caterpillars, but parasitoids are important too. So this is a caterpillar that fell victim to the stigmata mummy wasp. Um, and it, it's a little bit different than the braconid wasp I just showed you, but it will actually complete its pupation inside of the caterpillar so it'll transform to an adult wasp and then they eat their way out and just fly away. So I think that's pretty cool. I actually found this on, it was a cattail. Um, the marsh daggers like to live around or they like to eat plants that are around water. So if you're ever around a wetland and you see something like this, that's, that's what happened to it. And then we've got caterpillar zombies. So this is even getting more fur out there. So this is the work of the Glyp Glypta pantiles wasp. Um, and just like the braconid wasp, they will inject their eggs in the caterpillar. The babies will eat, their, eat the insides, but then when they eat their way out of the caterpillar, um, they somehow can convince the caterpillar to spin a cocoon around, the, around them, around the wasp larvae. Um, so instead of building or making its own cocoon. It makes this cocoon for these wasp babies. And if that weren't enough, it acts as their bodyguard. So it sits on top of this cocoon that it made. And if anything tries to come eat them or bother them, it will wave around and try to swat them away. So I think, I think it's pretty cool, real life zombies. Um, and then we also have parasitoid flies. So just like the wasps, they will lay their eggs on or in a caterpillar. 
Um, if you ever see a fly that has this like bristly abdomen, I call them bristly butts, um, it's probably a tachinid fly. So here you can see the tachinid fly watching this caterpillar kind of looking for a, a good spot to lay the eggs, which isn't going to be easy since this caterpillar is covered in hairs. Um, but that's what the eggs look like. They kind of just look like little tiny eggs. Um, you can see two on this one. Um, there are also predatory bugs that eat caterpillars. So this one is a, a spined, a spined soldier bug nymph, and then this one is a spined assassin bug. Um, these guys are cool because they inject venom into the caterpillar with this like stabbing mouth part called a stylus. And then they lick the inside of the caterpillar gets liquefied and they just drink it out like a milkshake. All right, now we're going to look at a furrier predator. So I'm going to hopefully I have to leave this to show, share another video with you. So hopefully everything goes OK. Move this. So this is a black bear. And this video was taken in Minnesota during an, a forest tent caterpillar outbreak. You guys seen it okay? Yeah. Okay. So you can see this bear's name is Terry. And you can see her just gorging, feasting on these caterpillars. So all those black fuzzy things. So she is just loving those. So a researcher followed Terry around um, and discovered that um, in her scat, you could find the skins of all these caterpillars. So the caterpillars were digested, but their skins just passed through under her scat. Um, so I don't know who this was, but I feel sorry for them. But it was good for science. Oh, there we go. Um, so they found that Terry ate over 25,000 caterpillars in one day. Um, which equates to about equated to about 21 pounds a day. So that was a, between 400 and 800 pounds during the entire outbreak. So that was a lot of caterpillars. Um, and that was just one black bear. So obviously they're not eating those year round, but when there are outbreaks like that, black bears definitely can take advantage of, of that food source. Um, so if this is all sound, sounded like a bunch of doom and gloom for caterpillars, it really is. If you're a caterpillar, your chances of becoming an adult is not great. It's less than 1%. Um, this is another one of those tobacco hornworms. And you can see this is a final instar on the bottom. And this is one of probably a second or third, third instar. So caterpillars grow through instars and they molt. Um, think of like a snake shedding its skin. A caterpillar does something similar. Um, so you can kind of see the size difference. Caterpillars have to eat a lot to get as big as they do and to become adults. And the chances are before they can do that, they're going to become food themselves. But that's great because they're food for lots of wildlife. So even if you do make it to a moth, if you're a caterpillar, your odds are still not good of surviving. So even our moths are eaten by a lot of um, animals. So this is a painted lichen moth that's being eaten by a spine soldier bug, another nymph. And this is a bolus spider. So bolus spiders are pretty cool. Um, this is a female and they don't hunt like other orb weaving, orb weaving spiders that you typically think of. They don't build webs. 
Um, a lot of times if a moth flies into a typical spider web, they can escape because their scales come off so easily. It's kind of one of the adaptations they have. Um, so this is a bola spider and she actually hunts with this string of silk with this like glue, this drop of silk on the end is special and it's really extra sticky and gluey. Um, and she will release these pheromones of female, female moths. So pheromones, I'm sure you guys know, are how animals can find each other, how they attract each other. Um, so she tricks these male moths into flying towards her because they think that she's a female moth. Um, and then when they get close enough, she can kind of lasso them up with her, with her strand of silk and consume them. Um, here's another fate that's gruesome for some adult moths. Um, this is the, a moth that's been infected by the cordyceps fungus. Um, if you've seen the show, The Last of Us, this is kind of the premise behind that show. Um, but what happens is the, these fungal spores get inside of an insect and the hyphae grow and grow and grow. And eventually um, the, the fungus can make the insect go to someplace high with moths, they'll climb up the bark of a tree or up to a leaf. Um, with ants, they'll climb up a blade of grass and chomp down on the end of it. And then that's when the fungus fruits. So kind of the mushrooms are the fruiting part of the fungus. And then that insect is in a good position for when the spores are released to infect more insects. Um, so we kind of call them zombie fungi too because they are kind of mind controlling in a way. Pretty cool. Um, Eastern whippoorwills. So this is a bird that is suffering a lot. Um, at least in Ohio, they're in severe declines. Um, they are active at dusk and unsurprisingly, they eat a lot of moths. Um, and you might be wondering if you look at its beak, like that is a teeny tiny mouth. How is that thing gonna eat a giant moth um, or even a normal sized moth? Um, but they do have these really cool whiskers um, for helping them sense in the dark so they can feel their prey. Um, but I'm going to show you a video. You can see how big their mouths actually are. <laughs> so yeah, they have really have huge mouths. They're just hiding under all those feathers. So perfect for downing lots of moths. I can get it to advance. There we go. So unsurprisingly, our aerial insectivores um, are in decline um, because our insects are in decline. So barn swallows, uh, flycatchers, you think about all of those types of birds, they are um, one of our biggest bird uh, groups that are in decline. All right, so moths' biggest enemy are bats. A lot of times when we think about bats, we think, oh, they're eating all of our mosquitoes for us. But if you think about a tiny little mosquito compared to a juicy moth, which would you rather have if you were a bat? You're gonna want something bigger and meatier um, with more energy. So bats, uh, at least in our, in our region, are eating a lot of moths. Beetles come in a close second, but mostly moths. Um, and moths have evolved lots of strategies to try to evade getting eaten by these bats. Um, so the number one strategy is just to, if you, if a bat is getting close to you, you nosedive to the ground. So that's what um, our underwing moths do. And a lot of our other noctuid moths, they have evolved ears so they can actually hear uh, the echolocating calls from the bats. Um, hopefully you're all familiar with echolocation. It's kind of like sonar. So the bats emitting these high, high um, ultrasonic pitch sig signals, and those signals are bouncing off of their prey items, and then that's how they can find them. Um, so a lot of, not all of our moths, but some of our moths have ears and can actually hear the bats coming, so they can try to escape from them. Um, this is our giant leopard moth, and they have ears too, um, but they can also communicate back with the bats. They put off their own ultrasonic ultrasonic signals that tell the bat that they are toxic. Um, so the bats have learned, hey, if I hear this, I don't want to eat that because it's going to either make me really sick or it's not going to taste good. 
Um, this guy is really cool. This is one of our mic micro moths. It's probably only a centimeter long. Um, it's called the American ermine moth. And they, have, they don't have ears, so they can't hear the bats, but they are mimicking, they have learned to mimic um, these moths, like the last one I showed you, the giant leopard moth. And they send off these ultrasonic signals um, that tell the bats that, bats that they taste bad, even though they're not actually toxic. Um, the bat could eat it and feel just fine. So they're just kind of tricking the bat into thinking that they're, they taste bad, even though they don't. Um, and since they can't tell when the bats are around because they can't hear, they just are putting off these signals constantly when they're flying. So just as kind of a, an overall defense. Now this moth is pretty cool. Um, we don't have this in our region. It's found out in west, the Western US in the desert area. Um, it's called Groth's Bertholdia, um, but it can do something that no other moth can do that they've found so far. So these guys can put off ultrasonic signals so quickly, so fast that it actually jams the bat signals. So the bat signals are hitting it and bouncing back off um, because they can, they can do it so quickly, which I think is pretty cool. Now, Luna moths, we think they're so beautiful and part of their beauty comes from these like long, their hind wing uh, tails, we call them, or streamers. Um, but lately or recently, researchers have discovered the purpose of these tails, we call them, you know, they're really parts of their wings. Um, and that is they, when the luna moths are flying, those tails are kind of um, circling around in the air. Um, and when the bat is echolocating, its calls kind of are focusing on those tails and it distracts the bat from kind of attacking the rest of the moth's body. So even you can see the one on the right has been attacked by a bat. The bat got its hind wings, but the main part of the moth is still fine. So it can still li live to lay eggs and reproduce. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> this is one of my favorite moths. So this is the dot-lined white. They're not very big, but they are just so cute, especially when you look at them from this angle. Um, but some of our moths are really furry, it seems like. It's not really hair or fur, it's actually just modified scales. Um, and scientists have always thought that this hairiness or excessive furriness is because they're nocturnal um, and it helps keep them warmer at night. And that is the case, um, but there are a lot of species that are found in tropical areas and really warm areas that are also very furry. Um, and so they've done some more research and discovered that the furrier, the hairier you are, um, the more of the bats echolocating calls that you absorb. So it's called acoustic camouflage. Um, so if the, the furrier you are, the less likely you are to be eaten by a bat um, because those sounds are just getting absorbed into all of that, all of that extra fur. Now, I, I know I've kind of made it, made it sound like caterpillars and moths are just like free food for the taking um, for everything, but they are not defenseless. I could do a whole other talk just about all the defenses that moths and caterpillars have. Um, this is probably one of my favorite caterpillars. Um, this is called a filament bearer. Um, and it has, it's one of, it's very tiny, an inch long at max, um, but it has these tentacles, they're called, that it can inflate with liquid um, really suddenly if it's disturbed. And so they just kind of flail out kind of like a, a balloon getting blown up and they can wave them around to try to swat away the parasitoids that I talked about, those wasps and flies. So that's just one of the defenses that they have. All right, so now we know um, moths are pretty and important. Um, how do we garden for them? So let's talk about that. So we're going to talk about, or we're going to use the monarch as kind of an example, since I feel like everyone's pretty familiar with monarchs um, and what they need to thrive. Um, so on the left, you can see the monarch on nectarine, which we talked about nectar plants. And for monarchs, it's obviously important to have fall, fall blooming nectar plants um, for when they're migrating. But we also all know that they need, I'm not even gonna ask you, because I know you guys all know this, they all need milkweed. Um, milkweed is their host plant. That's what they're adapted to eating. So when we want to think about moss, we're going to talk about um, the nectar plants, but host plants are super important. So we really want to think about feeding their caterpillars. So 
So let's look at everyone's, not maybe not everyone's favorite moth, but this is a lot of people's favorite moth, the Luna moth. Uh, it is very, very beautiful. Um, I don't know that anybody would not want to attract this to their yard or their garden. Um, but they are polyphagous. Well, first of all, the adults can't even eat. So you're not going to be attracting a Luna moth with nectar plants. The adults only live for a week, um, maybe a few days longer than that. They don't have mouth parts, so they don't even feed. They're just relying on that stored up energy from when they were a caterpillar. Um, so we can't think about nectar plants. We have to think about host plants for those. Um, luckily, they are, here's the, here's the Luna caterpillar. Luckily, they are polyphagous. So that just means that they eat a wide variety. So unlike the monarch, who is a specialist of milkweed, Luna moth caterpillars can eat lots of different plants, um, mostly trees and shrubs. So you can see lots of natives here. Um, so this is fragrant sumac, choke cherry, sweet gum, um, tulip tree, spice bush, river birch, you get the picture. So lots of native plants. Um, and in our Gardening for Moths book, we actually have a list of all of those, um, if you're curious. Um, and it sounds like you guys are really into natives from what I heard from the introduction. So um, you probably know this already, but if you're planting plants that aren't native to our region, if they're from Europe or Asia, um, and a lot of that is found in our garden centers, um, they're not going to be feeding our caterpillars. Um, our caterpillars haven't had the time to adapt to eating them yet. Um, our species here have evolved with the plants here and that's taken thousands of years. So it's not gonna just happen in a decade or two since we've introduced these, these non-natives. Um, and if you're worried about caterpillars eating all of your plants, that's not gonna happen. Remember everything that eats them. So out of a hundred caterpillars, most of them are gonna get eaten. Um, but caterpillars are really cool. So th this is just some of the beautiful, unique, interesting caterpillars that we have in our area. Um, here is a table of the top trees for growing moths. Um, on the left, these numbers are the number of uh, Lepidopteran species that can use that family as a host. So you can see oaks host the most species. Um, they host almost 500 species in our region. And these are all taken from the Native Plant Finder website. If you haven't used that or heard of it, it's really awesome. Um, I think Doug Tallamy and his colleagues partnered with the National Wildlife Federation, I believe, to create that. Um, so if you just Google Native Plant Finder and that website will pop up. And then you can actually type in your own zip code and you can get these numbers for exactly where you live. And it will tell you which species are native to your area, um, it will tell you all of the species of Lepidopteran that they host, um, but it'll give you like the top 20 or top 15 um, of the coolest ones. So that's a website that I really use a lot and I love. Um, hopefully you guys have some of these trees planted in your yards. If not, you should. Um, here are some of the top shrubs and bushes for growing moths. So you can see, uh, and obviously when I say roses, that's our native roses, like um, pasture, climb, or climbing pasture rose and smooth rose. We've got several natives that are really pretty. Um, and same thing with sunflowers on this list. When I say sunflowers, I don't mean like your giant garden sunflowers. Those are gonna be our native helianthus species, like this Maximilian sunflower. Um, this is one of my favorite natives. Uh, hibiscus. So a lot of people think it's very tropical looking, but it's actually a perennial that will come back every year if you get the native ones to Ohio. Golden rods, awesome. Sunflowers, strawberries. This is one of my favorite moths. A lot of times people ask me who my favorite moth is, and this is the wavy line emerald. And it's a very pretty moth. It's very little, um, so you might not notice it but their caterpillars are so cool. So the, here is a wavy line emerald on common milkweed. Um, but here is the caterpillar. So the caterpillar is called the camouflaged looper. And what these guys do is they eat flowers 
and they will chomp off some flower pieces and actually attach the flower petals or pieces of the flower to their backs. So that way they always look like whatever food they're eating. Um, so if you can see, here's his head, and then there's his rear end. And these guys are tiny too. They're about an inch long. They're one of our inchworm caterpillars. Um, here's one that was on, I think, gray-headed coneflower. Um, but you can see they look different based on um, what their disguise is for the day. So there's its head. Oh, and then here is one that's on common yarrow. Um, and there's its head. So it looks white. Um, the way I look for these is um, look for an anomaly in the flower or maybe a moving flower um, or sometimes so when they do attach all of these pieces to their back, they will kind of put this shellac on with their saliva that preserves the flower, the petals making them last longer. Um, but they do sometimes dry out and they'll turn brown. So if you see like uh, dried up brown things moving too, it's probably one of these. I'm sure you have them in your garden. They're very common. Um, most people just don't notice them. So this is one that was on the Atris, a uh, blazing star. There's its head. This one I actually caught in the act, this was at my house, um, of decorating itself with a purple comb flower developing seed head. So you can see here's his head and he's attaching that uh, a seed head to his back. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and then this bumblebee had no idea that he was nectaring from a flower that the camouflage looper was on. You can see it right here. So he chomped up the petals down here. Well, they're, they're not petals, but. Um, and then he moved up to the, the center of the flower. So here are some of the plants um, that I've seen camouflage loopers on, if you have any of these in your garden. Um, compa composite flowers in the aster family are kind of what they specialize on. So if you have never seen one, get out in your garden and look tomorrow or, or today. Now, not all of our uh, caterpillars are polyphagous, like the Luna and like some of the other ones we've talked about. So this is a gold moth. And just like the monarch with milkweed, they are a specialist. So they will only eat um, wing stem. So we have to think about um, planting for specialists too, not just the generalists. So those lists I gave you with all of the species, those are really good if you wanna attract a lot of moths, but if you wanna attract specific moths, you it's important to know if they're a specialist or a generalist. So this is a moon seed moth and it only eats this beautiful moon seed vine. Um, this is a primrose moth and I'm sure you all can guess what it eats. Evening primrose. This is a goldenrod stowaway. It does not eat goldenrod, it's a misnomer. Um, it actually eats plants in the Bidens family. So they're called baker ticks. Uh, they have those little brown seeds that get stuck all over your, your clothes in the fall. Um, but some of them can be very beautiful. So Jim, my co-author, actually um, called me up one day at work because we were, working, we were still uh, preparing for the book. And I had just gotten this photo um, that we, it wasn't too late to get in. So he was trying to figure out what species of baker ticks this was on. So I walked out because um, I had seen it just outside of where I work. Um, at our nature center in our, in our pollinator garden. And I'm kind of describing the flowers to him so he can try to figure out what species they are. And then I start seeing all these little caterpillars um, on the flowers eating them. And I was like, oh, Jim, the caterpillars are everywhere. So these little green, yellow, or little yellow and green caterpillars. And this one had just uh, molted. So it just shed its skin. You can see it right here. And its head capsule, actually, it's eating which I thought was pretty cool. So then we ended up getting this photo in the book too, which was exciting because we didn't we had never seen the caterpillars before. Um, so I'm assuming a lot of you are gardeners um, and you're not gonna be planting wild grape in your gardens. Um, I wouldn't ask you to, but there are a lot of plants including grape that are really good to leave in wild spaces or if you have an area of your yard that you don't mind it being a little bit more messy. Um, grape is an awesome host for uh, caterpillars. So if you let grape grow, you might have an spotted forester, an abbot sphinx, Pandora sphinx, a grape leaf skeletonizer, beautiful wood nymph, a grapevine root borer, 
mournful thyrus, an achaemen sphinx, a great plume moth, a great leaf folder, a polyphemus moth, a bad wing, a white line sphinx, a great vine epimenus, Virginia creeper sphinx, or a Virginian tiger moth. So well, those are just some of the species that whose caterpillars are specialists of grape. Um, and Virginia creeper too, you can throw that in there. Um, so here are some other weeds that we think things we normally consider to be weedy and we might pull them out of our flower beds. That's okay, but if you have um, places that you can let them grow, that would I would really encourage you to. Um, you might get some of these beautiful moths that you see. So these guys really like um, nine bark. Do you have any nine bark at your house? Um, they also feed on blackberry, dewberry, other, mem other mem members of the rubus family. Um, this guy is one of my favorite moths because it is a specialist of poison ivy. So if you let poison ivy grow, you might get one of these little moths. Um, it's a beautiful utilia. And then even if you don't want to necessarily outright garden for moths, which hopefully I've convinced you to, um, if you just don't spray your lawn, if you just let your lawn be a little weedy and let the dandelions and the plantain and the clover grow, um, you might get some of these cool moths. They're pretty polyphagous. They'll eat about, just about anything, but they're not gonna just eat your grass. So try to let other things grow. Now, not all moths can be garden for. So this is a black and yellow lichen moth caterpillar and they don't eat plants, they actually eat lichens. So a lichen is kind of a symbiotic uh, organism that is um, has a fungal component and an algal component, component um, and sometimes some other things too. But they are actually eating the algae off the algal component of the, of the lichen. And here's what the moth looks like. Very pretty, very cool. Here are some of our other lichen moths. On the left is a scarlet winged lichen moth and then the painted lichen moth. Very pretty and they are toxic. That's why they're so bright brightly colored. Then we have these mermaid moths. Now they're not really called mermaid moths. I just like to call them that because um, the adult moth actually has to dive down into the water to lay her eggs on rocks. Um, and then when they, the eggs hatch, these caterpillars are completely aquatic. So you can see these filamentous gills on the side. Um, they kind of look like little spaghetti hairs. Um, they all actually build this like cocoon sack around themselves and feed from within it. And what they do is they scrape algae off of rocks and then they're also getting, just filtering things out of the water to eat too. So I think they're pretty cool. And they're in the genus Petrophila. Moths are very showy too, but they're very, very tiny. So you probably wouldn't notice them either. Um, now this moth is, kind of gets its revenge on the wasps. So they are not vegetarian. So this is called the sooty winged Chalcela and they, lay their eggs around paper wasp nests. So what happens is the female moth or the female moth will uh, kind of lay its eggs around the top of, or around the base of the nest. And then when the eggs hatch, the caterpillars have to climb down this pedicel and into the wasp nest. And then you can, you can actually see the wasp eggs in here. But once the, these eggs hatch, there's wasp larvae. Um, and then the moths, moth caterpillars will actually eat the wasp larvae. Um, so we like to think of it as them getting their karmic revenge, but. So here's a picture that Jim got of uh, one of, this is one of the caterpillars. So they look a lot like a wasp larva um, emerging from a paper wasp nest. And interestingly, if you, uh, they've done research and Paper wasp nests that are on buildings are more likely to be parasitized by the sooty winged Chalcela moths. Um, I don't know if it's easier for them to get into the nest if they figure that out, but um, if you have a paper wasp nest, I encourage you to leave them. Um, I leave them around my house and I've never been stung. Um, they usually want to leave you alone unless you get really super close to their nest. It's usually when people are trying to get rid of them, they get stung. So if you just leave them alone, They'll do their own thing and there'll be food for some really cool moths. All right, so what else can you do as a gardener to help moths? Um, leave your leaves. So leaf litter is so important for moths. Um, you can see these guys are really camouflaged with the leaves. That's what they're um, adapted to do. 
And leaf litter is also caterpillar food. So some of our uh, caterpillars don't eat living leaves, they eat dead leaves, um, several of our species. So if you're shredding the leaves or you're bagging them up and taking them away, um, you're taking away their food. Um, leaf litter is shelter for a lot of caterpillars and moths. Um, and then a lot of our moths will overwinter as cocoons in leaf litter. So if you are mowing that up or you're blowing it away or getting rid of it, you're getting rid of those, um, those pupil cases. So leave your leaves. Um, if you have to move them, I encourage you to leave them intact and just move them to a pile someplace in your yard um, or maybe give them to somebody else who can leave them someplace. Um, that way you're not taking away that food and that shelter um, and the overwintering place for our moths. Um, I know Adrian touched on this before we started, um, but turning your lights out at night is so, so important. Um, I know, I think Doug said that if you have blue lights, it's better for insects, but I really encourage you, if you feel like you have to have a light on for security, um, to put it on a motion sensor. So that way it's only turning on if you know someone's out there in front of it. We really don't need, I know we think we need lights for security for everything, but the amount of light pollution is just crazy, which I'm sure um, Ken touched on last week, well, talked about last week. So, um, and then cut out your insect, insecticide use. There's really just no reason to use insecticides. Um, a lot of times if you're having a pest problem, if you just give it a week or two, something else will take care of it for you in nature. Um, we had we had purple milkweed growing at our nature center right by the door, and we had aphids on them really bad this year. And it does make them unsightly um, for this growing season. But after a week or two of aphids being there, I started seeing the lady, the lady beetle larvae coming in and eating them. Um, and other, other things were predating them too. So if you kind of just let nature take its course, it'll, the pests will usually be taken care of on their own, especially with native plants. Um, and you can see uh, our butterflies, well, I should say moths. We'll cross this out and write moths. Um, but the insect order of Lepidoptera is the second highest one that's in decline after caddisflies. And this is because of water pollution. Um, caddisflies spend their, uh, their, their larval stage in the water. So, so not good for butterflies and moths. So why garden for moths? Hopefully, hopefully you figured it out by now. We garden for moths, we're gardening for bolus spiders, we're gardening for tree frogs, gardening for bats, gardening for flying squirrels, gardening for uh, rare orchids, gardening for cool wasps, gardening for whippoorwills and their relatives, gardening for Tennessee warblers and other songbirds that rely on their caterpillars, you're gardening for zombie fungi, and you're gardening for the enjoyment of kids and people. Um, this is Ellie. She was one of my preschoolers last year, and she was just amazed by that hickory horn devil. That was the same one that was in the hot dog bun. So if you plant it, we will come. And then hopefully, um, Laura, can you read questions? I sure can. Um, thank, thank you. you. Should I stop sharing my screen? I have that image is so beautiful. <laughs> oh, you can just leave it up there. <laughs> we'll get rid of the words. I love it. Um, so we can see all their cute faces. <laughs> so I just want to, in the transition, I'd love to put a plug in for the book, Gardening for Moths, because it is just packed full of all of these gorgeous photographs both by Chelsea and by the co-author, Jim McCormack, who you've heard, heard her mention before. And it's just, you know, even if you're having a sort of a crummy day and you just thumb through this book, at least it cheers me up to see all of these cute faces. So, plus you learn a lot in addition to that, you learn a lot about moths and the plants that they depend upon. <laughs> 